Okay. All right. I was just saying to Jen before we got started that our family is just getting over a little cold. So I'm hoping my voice lasts. Speaking of voicing, uh, I'm doing good vocal hygiene, drinking lots of water. So if I need to pause every once in a while and drink some water, uh, I'll try to do that. So uh, thank you. Thank you again. I can't believe it's been since last March uh, when I presented on oral care. Uh, I love talking about these topics and the topic I'm going to be talking about today is absolutely my passion. Uh, so much so that as, as Jennifer mentioned, uh, I went out and created a program specifically for individuals with Parkinson's so that they can stay diligent with speech voice exercise. Uh, Jen, uh, Jen and I were talking in the beginning how one of the biggest barriers uh, that people with Parkinson's have is staying diligent, staying regular, staying motivated uh, with all of the things they need to do to live their best life with Parkinson's, whether that's eating what they need to eat, doing their exercises that they need to do, doing their voice and speech exercises on a regular basis. Uh, those things are really, really challenging because dopamine, and we know that Parkinson's is a paucity of dopamine, Dopamine is one of your get up and go neurotransmitters. It's one of the things that helps you to stay motivated and on top of what you need to do. So people with Parkinson's can already be behind the eight ball in uh, as far as motivation. So we need to bring in every tool that we, that we can bring in in order to stay on top of, keep ourselves doing the things that we need to do to be our best selves and to live well with Parkinson's. So that's hopefully what I'm going to inspire in you today. And it doesn't have to be taxing. It doesn't have to be hours a day. It can be five or 10 minutes a day, honestly. So Jen did such a fantastic job introducing me that I don't have to go through that. But yes, I am a Canadian registered speech pathologist. Uh, and I created along with my team, the Get Loud, Stay Loud program. Uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about and Jen will be sending you a link to try. Anyone can try it free for 30 days. So what are we going to be talking about today? We are going to be talking about what are the common uh, speech and voice issues that occur in Parkinson's and why do they occur? What are what I call the bread and butter, the essential exercises everyone with Parkinson's should be doing daily? Why it's never too early or too late, but never too early to start doing speech and voice exercise, uh, how to get started and how do you stay diligent with these kinds of exercises. And then at the end, of course, um, we'll uh, do our best to answer any questions that you have. So maybe if you think of them as we go along, just type them out in the chat and Jen and her team will monitor and try to um, um, uh, amalgamate the questions so that I can do my best to answer them at the end. So as I said, what is Parkinson's? Parkinson's is when an area of the brain called the substantia nigra or the basal ganglia stops producing sufficient levels of, of dopamine. And dopamine is needed in order for your body to do normal fluid movements. So what are some of the things that can occur as a result of this dopamine deficiency? And we know that Parkinson's can cause a number of things to happen throughout pretty much every system in the body. There can be tremor, uh, rigidity or stiffness uh, of muscles, slowed movements. Uh, the most pervasive, uh, I think, is smaller movements, and it's often referred to as the disease of low amplitude. And we'll talk more about that and how pervasive that is throughout the body. And then also difficulty getting movement started. So maybe once you kind of get the step going, you're able to do good fluid walking, but sometimes just getting the movement going, even getting speech going can be a challenge. And of course, this is where working very closely with your movement disorder specialist um, and your pharmacist and your healthcare team to make sure that you are on the right medication, the right dose of the medication, the right timing of the medication. It's really for each person, it's quite a journey to figure out uh, the maximum benefit from those Parkinson's specific medications while minimizing any potential side effects that the medication can cause. So for every person, that's always a little bit different and it can be quite a process uh, to figure out what's the right dose uh, and timing of dose for you. 
So what are some of the communication issues specifically that can happen with Parkinson's? Uh, and they tend to be pretty global uh, for, for people. Some people get more voicing issues to start with and then more articulation issues, vice versa. So it really depends on the person. Uh, but uh, almost consistently, these are the ones that tend to present. So uh, mumbled or less articulated speech, so less clear speech. And if you think about that, Parkinson's making movements smaller also includes articulation movements. So whereas before you were making big mouth, tongue, lip, jaw movements, if all of a sudden those become reduced because of what Parkinson's is doing, uh, then the speech can become more mumbled and less clear. There can be difficulty with the fluency or the pacing of your speech. Some people present with what's called festinating speech. And this is when speech comes out in a, in a very unclear burst or clutter. Uh, and if you've heard the word festinating, it also applies in Parkinson's to gait pattern. Some people get kind of this really uh, stumbly, fast, uh, discoordinated gait pattern which is called festinating gait, so that that can happen with our speech as well. The number one complaint that we get from as speech pathologists are, is that the voice, the vocal amplitude reduces. So often uh, people say, <clears throat> I used to have a really strong, booming, clear voice, and now people are always asking me to repeat myself. And I'll tell you a little funny story is that it's happened more than once that we've had clients whose spouse actually went and got a hearing test because they kept saying to their partner with Parkinson's, I can't hear you, you're not being clear, you're not being loud. And the problem with Parkinson's is we're not always aware of when we're not being clear and loud. So that person is saying, I'm fine, I'm speaking perfectly loud, it must be a hearing problem. And that person goes and gets their hearing tested while well, their hearing turns out to be fine. Uh, it's just a lack of awareness that can happen. And we'll talk about why that is. There could be changes to the quality of your voice. So the, the voice can become hoarse or harsh or breathy or strained sounding. And a lot of people say or that just sounds thin, it doesn't sound as strong or throaty as it used to sound. Uh, there can be difficulty, as I mentioned, initiating speech, kind of getting um, the words to come out. And again, that's that difficulty initiating movement. Speech, swallowing, voice is still movement. These are systems in the body that are, uh, again, at the mercy of that dopamine deficiency. So when that low amplitude that Parkinson's imposes, um, it can affect um, amplitude of speech, size of articulation, full range of swallow function. And lastly, and not most insignificantly, because this can have significant psychosocial emotional impact, is there can be reduced facial expression. You've probably all heard the term facial masking or hypomimia uh, or masked Faces. These are all terms for when uh, there starts to become less movement, less animation in the face. And if you think about communication, uh, only about 20% of communication is what we say. The rest of it are those nonverbal cues, body language, gesture, facial expression, movement. So when uh, gestures and facial expressions start to become significantly reduced, all of a sudden that can have a significant impact on how we're portraying what we're saying, the emotion behind what we're saying, because you've all probably had that experience before where maybe your partner or your friend says something and what they say isn't uh, all that offensive, but the facial expression, the tone, all of those things um, that kind of underlie communication, those nonverbals, uh, tell a much bigger story than the actual words. So we can't um, discount how, how uh, devastating it can be when facial expression becomes reduced. And people always ask, 
Is there anything I can do? Absolutely. There are still exercises that you can include in your speech and voice exercise routine to try to get those facial muscles moving again, because it's not actually a muscle weakness. It's not the same thing that happens in stroke where lack of blood flow to a certain part of the brain uh, results in less ability to move the muscle. What's happening in Parkinson's is what's called the faulty feedback loop. So the lack of dopamine causes your brain to give you false information. So whatever you're doing, arm swing, length of stride, size of your voice, size of your facial movement, your brain tells you you're making significantly big normal movements. That's false information. Usually what's happening is you're making small movements, but your brain tells you you're making normal movement. So what happens? You're not recognizing that you're not making big movements. So you don't, uh, you don't change. You don't increase the effort. You don't say, oh, that voice was too quiet. I had better be a little bit louder next time. Or that articulation um, uh, when, I, when I said that sentence wasn't very clear. So I had better articulate more clearly next time. That faulty feedback loop stops that awareness from happening. Uh, and as you can see in our diagram here, most people with Parkinson's in the mid to late stages present with a very soft to a soft voice, uh, but they believe they're up here. They believe they're up in the normal loudness range. So a lot of our approach, therapy, exercise techniques, as far as speech and voice, have to do with um, increasing the amplitude of our movements, increasing the voice volume, increasing the articulation uh, movements, so that we're kind of aiming up here in the loud zone, so that uh, it comes back to a more nor normal loudness level. So you kind of have to overcome the faulty feedback loop. You have to accept and understand that it's happening to know that when you are a little louder than feels necessary, when you're over articulating a little more than feels necessary, you're really just kind of coming up to a more normal production of that speech and voice. And you'll notice the same approach if you do any kind of physical therapy program, like um, uh, uh, LSVT loud is the speech one, LSVT big is the physical therapy one. Uh, so making uh, movement <coughs> bigger and more exaggerated. So what are the Parkinson's specific uh, programs or approaches that you can avail yourself of? The most well known is called LSVT loud and that stands for Lee Silverman voice training and this whole approach is think loud okay so if you go to LSVT global I think the website is there's actually a clinician search and you can put in your state or your area and you can find an LSVT certified clinician if you want that one on one direct therapy. Now the therapy is typically four days a week uh, for four weeks in a row, so it is very, very intense on the days that you have therapy and the non therapy days there's even extra homework to do, so it is a very intense program with the approach of recalibrating the brain to what is an acceptable normal loudness level. Uh, another program um, that is uh, Parkinson specific is called Speak Out. You can also Google this. You can um, uh, search their clinician search. Um, and I'll just remind you that uh, even if the clinician doesn't physically live really close to you, many clinicians now, especially since COVID, since everything went online, um, many of these therapists are trained to offer it online. And it really, really does work well online uh, because it is so intense, three to four times a week, depending on the program. So if you had to get out to a therapist or a clinic or a hospital that many times a week, um, that can be quite uh, intense, especially if you have mobility issues or if you're getting into winter season where the uh, road conditions aren't the best. So these, um, these programs or these direct therapy one-on-one -on -one with the speech therapist 
can be offered online. So as long as they're, I think, within your state or they're registered within your state, you can see anyone from within your state. So you really have many more options now than even five or 10 years ago. So those uh, LSVT Loud and Speak Out <coughs> are two of the direct one-on-one -on -one therapy approaches. They are time limited, so they're typically a month long. And then after you're done, they'll say, continue to do these exercises every day for the rest of your life. Because we know that Parkinson's is progressive. We know that just doing a stint of one month of therapy and making amazing gains isn't enough. If you don't maintain um, and do the exercises after on a regular basis, you will lose the gains that you've made. So the most important thing is staying with it, staying diligent with those exercises after you're done the direct therapy. And this is where my Get Loud, Stay Loud program uh, was born because seeing uh, myself, clients for LSVT and Speak Out, I'm certified in both, um, most people fell off after the direct therapy. They just didn't continue with the daily exercises. So what Get Loud, Stay Loud is, is a daily tune in and follow along uh, Parkinson specific speech and voice exercise classes. So you just sign on either live or on the replay and you click the button, you do your 15, 20 minutes of voice and speech exercise, whether you're doing it for maintenance after therapy, or you just need some help, guidance, motivation and support to do a home program. Because maybe you're at the point where you just wanna maintain where you are, or you wanna prevent decline, or you just want some support with doing the exercises every day. That's where Get Loud, Stay Loud can come in. Um, and I know that Jen uh, will be sending out in the e-blast and also in the email following this uh, webinar to anyone who's registered, but it is a really good time to try it out because right now we're launching on Monday our holiday challenge where anyone can sign up free, absolutely free, no credit card required. Uh, and between November 21st and December 18th, we have a fun holiday challenge in the program where you attend classes, you listen for the secret holiday word, you track it, you can win prizes. So it is a great time to check it out. So Jen will be sending along that special link that you can register uh, and it starts on Monday. So it's actually a good time to, to be announcing that for anyone who just wants to give it a try. And you can attend classes either live or you can do the replay class, up to you. So what are, we talk about these exercises that everyone with Parkinson should be doing every day, but what are they? I call them the bread and butter exercises. These are the, these are the most important exercises. They are always included, um, whether it's LSVT, Speak Out, a personalized program that your speech pathologist gave you, home program. These are always the exercises that are the core essential exercises. So we're going to try them together. I hope you're up for that. Uh, so uh, just a couple of things before we start, just make sure that you're doing safe vocal exercise. The vocal cords are very delicate tissues. As you'll know, if you have a cold or you've been to a concert, they're very easily strained. So we wanna make sure that we're not doing any damage to those delicate little tissues. So uh, just make sure that when you do them, your posture is good. You're just sitting nice and tall, your chest is lifted. Uh, it's better to have a chair with a back support on it so you're not slouched. So you just kind of want to imagine that there's a string kind of pulling you up towards the ceiling so you get a nice tall spine. And then you want to make sure that when you're doing these exercises, you're powering your voice with a good, strong belly breath or a diaphragmatic breath. So what is a diaphragmatic breath? If you haven't done yoga, meditation, theater performance, you might not have done this. So uh, a diaphragmatic breath is when you breathe in, your belly expands with air and it's really a 360 breath. Your rib cage moves out in every direction. Uh, and then when you exhale, things kind of flatten back down. Most of us breathe wrong. We breathe from the upper chest. We tend to, um, power our voice by kind of slamming our vocal cords together to be louder. And this, you can't do very long without causing damage. So when you do a nice big diaphragmatic breath, you wanna breathe in through the nose 
and you want to think about a balloon expanding in your stomach and then you want to exhale so just give that a try breathing in through the nose expand the belly with air and then breathe out through slightly pursed lips and then breathe in and you can see in our little diagram here when he's breathing in the belly is expanding out and when he's breathing out the belly is flattening back down a good trick to see if you're doing it correctly with a really good visual is to just lie on a bed or a, a floor or a couch and then put a book on your stomach when you breathe in the book should rise when you breathe out the book should fall so if you really just want to uh, feel and have sort of some feedback as to whether you're doing it correctly try doing that just lying down book on the stomach breathe in book goes up breathe out and just do that for a couple of minutes and get yourself into that okay know that i'm breathing correctly i'm doing that nice deep diaphragmatic breath so uh, once you've got good posture and you know how to uh, power the voice with a strong breath you're going to do eight to ten long loud ah uh, okay so you're going to think uh breathe in through the nose good intentional breath uh, so you're going to keep that going for 10 whole seconds and feel free to do this okay so nice open mouth okay so you don't want to strain you don't want to yell uh, you just want to think about a confident well projected strong slightly louder than feels necessary voice someone in the next room should hear you but someone two doors down should not be able to hear you so this uh, these are your core bread and butter exercises and if you just did these you would be doing no more than five or ten minutes and that's very reasonable when you consider in your day something that you can do that's highly effective uh, in really strengthening the voice uh, recalibrating the brain to a normal loudness level uh, and then the next part that we'll do the butter exercise is getting that laryngeal movement which helps with swallow function which we'll talk about in a minute so let's try a few more of these good intentional breath uh, I know zoom tends to distort loud long noises so I'm not going to hold it the entire 10 seconds but you go ahead and do that so don't worry if you can't make 10 seconds. If you can make five seconds, that's great. Five strong, long, loud ah, good, okay? Maybe next time you'll hold it for six seconds. Maybe after a week, you're holding it for seven seconds. So don't worry if you can't do 10 seconds right off the bat. Do what you can do, and then always have that goal of maybe getting one second more each time. So let's try one more all together. Uh, and you can either set a timer, you can have your watch. Uh, some people like that little ding bell that goes off. It tells their brain, okay, I did it, jot it down. Some people like to count with uh, poker chips. Okay, every time I do want to put my poker chip or my penny or my dime to the side. Uh, so you can count your eight to 10 uh, ahs that you're doing. So the next exercise is a pitch exercise. So why are we doing pitch exercises? Are we trying to become better singers? No, we don't care about how we sound. What we care about is moving the laryngeal structure up and down. When we change pitch, when we lower and raise our pitch, what we're doing is actually raising and lowering the laryngeal structure, the larynx. The larynx is what uh, helps to protect our airway when we're swallowing. If we don't get full range of movement, that up and forward movement when we're swallowing, that's when the airway is unprotected and things can go down the wrong way. This is called aspiration. And if you have bacteria in the mouth or you're under the weather, it can create an environment where you can develop what's called an aspiration pneumonia. And we definitely want to avoid that. So doing these pitch exercises not just helps with uh, um, intonation in the voice, which is uh, we want to maintain as well, but more importantly, 
It helps to maintain the movement necessary for airway protection when we're swallowing. So now you understand the reason for doing the pitch exercises. And you wanna do eight to 10 going high and about eight to 10 going low. So uh, you would just start at a midline, ah. Uh, and if you're not sure where your ah uh, should be for these uh, exercises, your midline ah uh, is right about where you say hello. So hello ah. Uh. So for uh, some person, it might be really high. For another uh, person, maybe a gentleman, it might be a little bit lower. So start midline and you're gonna glide it up high like this. Ah. Okay, so you're still gonna think strong voice, but now you're gliding from low to high. You're making the larynx work. You're making the larynx rise. So let's try that again all together. Ah. Okay, so if you're at home, you'd maybe move your poker chip over. You just did two of them. Okay, again, good intentional breath. Ah. Okay, and if you feel your voice is warmed up, maybe you can challenge yourself. You can go a little bit higher than you did the last time. If the glide, ah, if that is just too challenging for you, you can also just do it one note at a time, like a scale or a stair step up. So maybe let's try that together. Ah. Okay, don't worry how it sounds, doesn't matter. And then, so once you've done eight to 10 of those going high, you would do the opposite. You would either do a glide or a stair step down. So let's try glide down from high to low. Ah. And again. Ah. So remember, open mouth, nice, strong, slightly louder than feels necessary voice. And you would do eight to 10 of those. Okay, so you've done eight ahs, eight pitch glides high, maybe eight pitch glides low, eight to 10. And if that's all you had time to do in your day, that might take you about eight minutes. So it's really not too, um, too labor intensive. So just to review, the louder the better, right? No, it is possible to be too loud. You do not wanna scream, you do not wanna yell, and you do not wanna strain. As I mentioned, the vocal cords, very delicate tissues. They're prone to stress and damage. Uh, when we do physical fitness, we used to say no pain, no gain. This does not apply in voice exercise. You want to stay hydrated. You want to power from the belly breath and you want to just project your voice. So I made a little uh, saying, it's not no pain, no gain. It's no pain, no strain, only healthy gains. If you are feeling any pain or discomfort when you're doing voice exercises, you need to stop and you need to go see your speech pathologist or an ENT and make sure there isn't something else going on with your voice. This is my favorite recommendation and you're gonna laugh at me, but it's actually really, really good idea. If you're short on time, do your voice exercises in the shower. You have warm, humid air, which is fantastic environment to do any kind of voice exercise. And the acoustics are great. You always sound fantastic in the shower. I don't know what it is, but you always sound great. Maybe just tell people in your family that this is your doing so they don't come running thinking that you're, you're having a moment, having a spell. Uh, but yeah, if you have five or 10 minutes just while you're doing what you're doing in the shower, uh, and you can, you know, mark on the wall with some soap or something how many you're doing. Uh, but it's a great way to multitask if you're really short on time. Okay, so just to review, what are you going to do daily? What is the recommendation? You're going to do eight to 10 long, loud, ahs. And I think we'll, I'll be sending this presentation to Jennifer so she can forward it to you. Eight to 10 pitch glides high, eight to 10 pitch glides low. If you have time, pick a book magazine, newspaper, Bible, whatever you have handy, and just read out loud in a well-projected, animated voice for about three to five minutes. That would be the extra thing to do if you have a little extra time. So how do you stay motivated? As I mentioned, Parkinson's, 
uh, lack of dopamine, uh, which is one of your get up and go motivational um, neurotransmitters, uh, can put you behind the eight ball of um, of not doing what you need to do. And I've heard this from so many people, you know, my spouse, partner, myself, I know what I need to do, but I just can't make myself do it. So these are, I came up with what are called SMART goals. Okay, so S stands for schedule. So put your speech exercise time in your calendar. Treat it like a dentist or a doctor's appointment so that you show up, okay? Treat it like an appointment. M stands for make it a priority. You always have time for things you put first. If you put it first, and some people like to do it first thing in the morning, they're well rested, they've just taken their medication, get it out of the way. Just do it at a time when you're more likely to do it. A is uh, accountable. Tell people that you're starting to do this. Tell family, loved ones, caregivers that you're going to be doing PD speech exercises and then maybe just ask them to check in with you and say, did you get your exercises done today? Good for you. Um, well done. My favorite one is R, I need to reward myself. I can't work out consistently unless I know there is a reward. So every time you do your exercise, maybe it's a cappuccino, a Netflix show, a walk with the dog in the park, something that you really, really enjoy so that you're motivated, your brain associates doing the speech exercise with a reward. Uh, T stands for team. Surround yourself with positive, motivational people. Uh, are you part of a, a PD support group? Find a speech partner and maybe arrange to either do your exercises together. You can even do them on Zoom. Uh, or at the same time, and maybe you text each other after to say, did you get yours done? No, I haven't yet, but I'm about to do it. I'll text you when I'm done and you know, you can give each other high fives and well done. So those are the SMART goals. And that's uh, just a little helpful acronym on how to stay motivated and how to stay diligent. So as we mentioned, just to review, what are the essential speech and voice exercises? It is those sustained vowel phonations. Uh, and the pitch exercises. The bonus that I want to mention is that because these exercises work on uh, the same muscles and systems involved in swallowing, when you do these exercises, you're not just improving your voice and your speech, you're also improving your swallow function. This is why speech pathologists many years ago uh, took on swallowing disorders and swallow rehabilitation as part of our skill set because anatomy, physiology, cranial nerves, uh, they, they all overlap as far as communication and swallowing. So it's a great two for one deal that you really can do these exercises uh, to improve both communication and swallowing function. And I uh, know a gentleman that said that since he has started doing these, he can now eat spinach again. He can now eat lettuce, things he wasn't able to eat before. He does these exercises regularly and his wife is amazed at how much improvement it's made in swallow function. So a little note about music-based activities. Um, you do not have to be a musical person. You do not have to be a singer. You don't have to have rhythm to gain the benefits of music-based uh, voice and speech exercise in Parkinson's. So if you have, and we'll go over the, the benefits on the next slide, but if you have anything music based in your life, choir, you do drums, um, you know, you sing in the shower, don't stop doing those things. There really is nothing better than music based activities as far as targeting all of the things uh, communication wise that can decline in Parkinson's. So how can that possibly be? So music is exercise uh, for your brain, your body and your voice. When you sing, you have to be able to control your breath. You have to have the respiratory stamina to hold notes, okay? So singing in itself is a really good uh, respiratory workout. When you sing, it strengthens your voice muscles, which improves vocal loudness and voice quality. Your laryngeal movement is getting a workout by way of pitch changes when you're singing or even humming up and down. We talked about how pitch change results in laryngeal movement. It encourages the control of the fluency or the pacing of your speech because you have to anticipate musical rhythm. You have to be able to come out with the words or the humming, whatever you're doing in the right sequence pattern and timing. 
Uh, and again, that's highly cognitive. Uh, even tapping your feet, clapping your hands can aid in the hand-eye brain coordination. So if you are involved in any kind of music-based, singing-based uh, activities, and there are actually Parkinson-specific choirs, many of them meet online, don't stop doing it. Uh, they are really, really wonderful um, as far as helping with uh, voice communication and swallowing function. So what are the key takeaways before we move into our question period? The key takeaway points that I want you to um, go away with, at, with after this webinar is it never too early to start doing voice exercise. I wish that doctors and movement disorder specialists would talk about this would refer to speech pathologists from the moment of diagnosis because it is so much my, my favorite expression an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure it is so much easier to maintain good communication and swallow function than to wait until it's a significant problem and then have to try to gain uh, back what you've lost that's not to say that we can't start doing these in the later stages of Parkinson's, you absolutely can. There is still lots of neuroplasticity in the brain, but it's just a lot easier to begin in the very early stages. I've had so many people say to me, oh, I'd love to see a therapist or I'd love to join your program, but I'm actually not having any communication or swallowing issues at the moment. And my response to that is fantastic. Let's keep it that way. Let's work now to slow the decline so that you are able to better stay on top of good voice, good speech, uh, good swallowing. So doing these uh, exercises regularly, daily if possible. Obviously, there's going to be days when you're just busy or lazy and don't want to do them. But if you can even do them four to five times a week, you're going to be so far ahead. And as we went through, they do not have to take an hour. You can do five to 20 minutes a day and have a great impact. Remember those bread and butter exercises, the long, loud ahs and the pitch glides. Those are the core ones. If you don't have time to do anything else, do those. Uh, remember that voice and speech exercise should never be painful. If it's painful, there's either something going on or you're not doing it correctly and you need to see a speech therapist or an ENT uh, just to make sure that there isn't another issue going on. If you can participate, and music singing based activities, whether it's singing to the grandkids, singing in the shower, singing in your car, what have you, Parkinson specific choir, uh, those are really, really magical activities to do. And lastly, that we're starting our holiday challenge on Get Loud, Stay Loud, where this is the only time of year we let people join, uh, free for 30 days, no strings attached, you just attend unlimited classes, have lots of fun, be in a highly motivational environment, um, and then see the benefits, see the benefits that this kind of um, voice and speech exercise can do for you. So that's, that's all I have. How, how did I do? Oh, good. 45 minutes. So that gives us some time for questions. I'm going Perfect. to stop sharing here. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. That was really informative. I was just um, going back and forth with my coworkers saying, she's such a fantastic speaker. Oh. <laughs> she's clear and she's precise and understandable. And so uh, thank you so You're much. Welcome. And your practical tips. I was just like, that smart slide, mm -hmm. like just printing it out. We are sending these to you folks. So okay. printing it out and sticking it up on the refrigerator or putting yep. it on your bathroom mirror or yep. just somewhere that's going to tick you to do those things um, is so good. Uh, so we are going to take questions from you all. And so if you find the Q&A function, uh, down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can type your question in there. If you type it in the chat, I'll also see it. So feel free to use either one of those functions. I will see that. So Dan had a question. I think Dan's from Moses Lake, where it's nice and chilly this morning, which is in Eastern Washington. And he asked how much, if anything, is covered by Medicare A, B, and C? So that, so that I'll, I'll start by saying I'm Canadian. So I don't, I don't 100% know. Um, that's a really good question. I, I'm quite sure that direct therapy like LSVT Loud or Speak Out 
are that direct therapy um, would be covered, but you'd have to really look into that. I'm not 100%. And I don't even know whether it varies state to state. Do you it have varies. Yeah, the the insight that I have is it varies by your plan, what is coverage, of course. Yeah. But generally, if you are seeing um, a speech therapist as a therapist, mm -hmm. and you are doing those LSVT loud or doing uh, the speak out program, like a, an actual dedicated program, or you're just seeing somebody one on one, yep. who knows Parkinson's, uh, then that is covered by Medicare. Okay. So, but a program like Sarah's, it, there is a cost involved, mm -hmm. but also remember that APDA has a financial support program. So if it is not some, if you ever find an exercise or program or something where you're like, I want to do this, but I just can't seem to fit it in financially, then APDA there mm -hmm. is there to help fill in those gaps. So we do have a financial support program. And I also just want that. to mention that we keep on Get Loud, Stay Loud, we do keep the price low. It's $34.99 a month, which is about a, a little over a dollar a day. Yeah. So it is, uh, for, for most people, it is... Um, within their um their means but yeah and i don't right. know if this is true jen but um in on in ontario canada we have something called the disability uh, tax credit where people can uh can submit their receipt from me to reduce their taxable income and i have no idea whether that's something that exists do you have anything like that i mean you can write off and like medical significant medical expenses okay. on your taxes, but I think mm -hmm. it's a big giant amount that, that you have to right. write off. There's there's yeah. rules to that. I'm not a tax professional, so know. yes. Me but it, <laughs> it's worthy of a conversation with your yeah. insurance because sometimes insurances will cover uh, some wellness programs like YMCA programs and silver sneakers and things like that. So I just wonder, depending on your insurance, yeah. so yeah. chatting with them about that. But certainly a therapist is covered by mm -hmm. Medicare. Uh, so the question comes from Laura. Do you need to do the month long intensive first? I think before like joining your program overall or something. I think that's what that's asking. Yeah. No, you don't have to. Um, some people have done LSVT or speak out and then they just use our program as a way to stay diligent with maintenance. And then some people are just in the phase where they just want to do some home exercise and it's been maybe recommended by their doctor. They're not mm -hmm. seeking out private one on one, um, but they're just kind of trying to maintain what they have or even make gains. You absolutely do not have to do that. It, it, you can just use it as a way to um, make your home practice more guided and more supported. Right, right. Great. Yeah. Uh, Barbara asks, when is using a spirometer, is that how you say it, appropriate? Sorry, I didn't you, know what that is. You glitched, you glitched when you said it at what? Spirometer, spirometer. Do you know what that uh, is? For respiratory, is it for respiratory? It just says, when is it appropriate? Okay, I'm. Uh, what I'm thinking of is an EMST device, was a, which is an um, expiratory muscle strength trainer. And there is a lot, if that's similar to what she's mentioning, uh, there is a ton of research coming out now on the benefits of uh, doing respiratory muscle strength training to not just um, make your cough stronger, uh, because think about if you have a weak cough and you have something go down the wrong way, if you're not able to get it out, uh, you're a higher risk of aspiration pneumonia. So there are many studies uh, coming out now, the benefits of using one of these um, muscle strength trainers to uh, to really strengthen the expiratory muscle strength. I think there's inspiratory and expiratory, but it's the expiratory one that I know most about. But yeah, I would say if you're interested in that, go speak to your speech pathologist or your doctor. There are sometimes mild contraindications if you've had a hemorrhagic stroke um, because of the pressure, um, but there are not very many contraindications, but you should just to be sure, just get the clearance from your doctor before you start anything like that. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, do you know how DBS treatment affects speech clarity and swallowing? And I'll just clarify for those of you who are not familiar, DBS stands for deep brain stimulation, which is a surgical treatment option for the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. 
So my experience, and this is just sort of anecdotal with people that I know that have had DBS, um, is that it really varies. Some people get improvements in their speech. Some people have a decline in their speech and some people have no change in their speech. The people that experience decline in my experience, um, they typically, it typically tends to affect the fluency or the pacing of your speech. So um, DBS maybe help to alleviate some of their motor uh, tremors and movements, but all of a sudden they get that what's called that festinating speech that kind of cluttered less controlled speech. Now this does not happen with with every person and I wonder that because I know with DBS it's constantly a tweaking that if that does happen I don't know if they can kind of tweak the settings to. Um, uh, to help see if that makes a difference. But it really, in my anecdotal experience with people that I know, it can be improvement, decline, or no change whatsoever. So really, maybe speak to the uh, your physician, and there should be there should be a speech pathologist attached to that team that can tell you they would know exactly the percentage risk of decline. But yeah, but for, right. for if it does cause a decline, it typically, in my experience, ha changes the fluency or the pacing of your speech. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. And I know with the newer technologies and the more that they learn and the more yes. that they're targeting it really like better specially. Better. So certainly yeah. this is a good question for your yeah. neurosurgeon. It's a good question for your doctor, that kind of thing. So great. But I think you're right that as they, as they start to know more about it, they are getting better and better at, um, you know, at reducing the, the risk of that happening. Right, right. Some uh, Reg asked, how do you spell festinate? And I think he spelled it correctly. Yes. <laughs> don't uh, you spell it for us? Uh, yeah, I have to like spell it with my finger. That's how my brain. Okay. F-E-S-T-I-N-A-T-E. So ah. festinate or festinating. Uh, yeah, if you Google festinating speech or festinating gait, it'll give you even videos, examples of that. Great. Great. And Reg, you spelled it right. Nice work. <laughs> Way to go, Reg. Yes. Uh, so we ha actually had a uh, question submitted early before the program, mm -hmm. and this individual's husband has PSP, which is one of the atypical Parkinson's that can be very, that can affect your speech very much. Mm -hmm. And so they, she is wondering um, if his speech has become almost unintelligible. And so it's, and typing and finding letters because of his coordination is very difficult. And so are there, are there ways, are there, are there tools or, or technology that can really help with this communication? Absolutely. So um, for anyone that doesn't know, PSP is progressive supranuclear palsy. And it's, as Jen mentioned, it's kind of a Parkinson plus syndrome. So there are similarities to Parkinson's, but it tends to be faster progressing. Uh, it tends to compared to typical Parkinson's, like it can decline in, in a matter of months or just a few years. Uh, and it really does have a strong impact on voice quality, voice loudness and speech intelligibility. So I have had clients with PSP where I did have great success using LSVT loud. So if this person um, has not yet sought out an assessment for LSVT loud, that would be the number one place that I would start, even if it is in the much moderate to later stages. Uh, the gentleman um, that I most recently saw was quite advanced and we still were able to make pretty significant gains in his voice and his speech. So seeking out an uh, assessment for LSVT loud uh, to see whether he would be a candidate for that. At the same time, I would seek out a speech pathologist who is uh, certified in what's called AAC. So that's alternative and augmentative communication. So these are speech pathologists that have special training in being able to assess and come up with um, um, a device or a system or an app or something that can help with like text to speech or um, you know just using some sort of device to help if if the communication has declined to the point where speech is completely unintelligible. So those would kind of be the two approaches that I would use, uh, especially knowing and if you're in the early stages of PSP knowing that it does decline so quickly that's a really good idea to get on that uh, sooner than later um, first of all trying to improve and maintain whatever speech and voice function that you have with an intense program and you really 
In that situation, you do need to see a speech pathologist one on one for an intense um, um, course of speech therapy at the same time getting your ducks in a row because the wait list I know for AAC can be a bit long. So the sooner the better to um, to see an AAC specialist. Okay, great. Thank you. So that is right now the last typed question that I have here if you think of something in the next couple of seconds here folks you can type something in. Uh, I want to tell speaking well two things I want to talk about one you were talking about singing and voice and doing that and I agree your acoustics in the shower are great same with your car <laughs> so good. And I also want to say that APDA has a program and it is called Sing Loud for Parkinson's. Exactly. And it is every Wednesday. It is so fun. It is led by a former Broadway star, or she, maybe she still is a Broadway star out of New York. Mm -hmm. And they have a piano person and she puts up the lyrics and you sing at the top of your lungs or, well, maybe not the top of your lungs because that is not appropriate. You <laughs> sing and there's all these people, you're not singing, you're on mute, but it is really, it's just a joyous program that really has a lot of therapeutic benefit and it's free. So it's every Wednesday and you can find that on our virtual calendar on our website. Uh, the other thing I want to tell you about is our next program, which is in about a month. So our next take control program and this is something we haven't done before and kind of in time for the holidays. So we are inviting a uh, physical therapist on who is going to talk about leveraging digital technologies in managing Parkinson's disease. There's a lot of technologies out there that can help in improvement of your life and managing your own Parkinson's disease. So she's going to talk about a lot of different options for that. So it should be quite interesting on how you harness some of this digital technology to improve your life. So she's going to be presenting on that on Tuesday, December 20th at 1030. So that'll be our next one. And I'll put a link to that in your post event email. And I love your puppy. What's your puppy's name? <laughs> Sophie. Sophie. Yes. Sophie has beautiful eyes. So. She does. <laughs> yes. Yes. I could get my dog up here and they could bark doing each other oh, yeah, right here absolutely. on the screen. We won't do that for you all. Okay. So any parting words for our audience, Sarah, before we sign off for the day? I would just say that don't be intimidated to start. Just start by doing something. Even five minutes is better than nothing. Um, and then if you really do need that support, um, seek out a private clinician, either LSVT or uh, speak out or um, try our program. It's really great way to stay motivated and stay on top of that. And then just giving you an idea of what you need to do. Because I think people get in sort of analysis paralysis. Like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. So those would be good places just to start. Surround yourself with people that can guide you and support you in that, uh, in that journey. Great, thank you. And you can always call or email us at APDA and we will try to connect you with a, a speech therapist who knows Parkinson's in your community or online because speech is a great thing that you can be doing online. Absolutely, yep. Yeah, so expect uh, early next week uh, before Thanksgiving, an email from me that will give you the recording to this. It'll give you a link to Sarah's slides and uh, other and information about our next program. And, oh, it will also have a link to a survey. We really do value your feedback on these programs. It's a four question survey. It's so actually only two multiple choice and two places for feedback. So very easy to do. So we'd really appreciate you letting us know how these programs and uh, are in your life and giving us suggestions for future programming. So take a moment to click on that. So. Thank you, Sarah, so much for coming back. Thank I'll you. I'll have you back anytime. Um, this is just fantastic information to share with our audience. I hope that uh, you have a wonderful, do you celebrate Thanksgiving in Mexico or are you celebrating? I mean, the well, we, ce we celebrated in, in October. That's the Canadian Thanksgiving. So, but oh, that's right. We're, our neighbors are American. So we hope we get invited to their Thanksgiving because I love Thanksgiving. So yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Well, I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank I am you. thankful for you in sharing all your information. Oh, so and sweet. I'm thankful for all of you who tuned in and for your support of APDA and continuing to join us for this type of programming. So have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Have a great Thanksgiving. And maybe we'll see you on December 20th at our next Take Control. All right. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.